Very often what's happened due to either circumstances or our own wrong choices in life, bad decisions, some born out of selfishness or ignorance or really someone making them for us. We end up in a place where we shouldn't be, lesser than God's design for us. And too many of us, far too many of us, accept it as if that's what the cards we've been dealt. And nothing but nothing can be further from the truth. You see, one of the most amazing revelations in the Bible is truly this, and we say it virtually every other week, that the evangelistic system that God proposed was not necessarily to go out and beat somebody over the head and convince them to be a Christian. That wasn't it at all. Far, far more important to God was the following system, that they would see the change in your life, in your family, in your immediate society, and would be so stirred by that change, that positive wind that came through your home, that they would inquire out of almost the spirit of envy and jealousy. Yeah, the Bible actually says that, that they would observe you. And finally, one day while you're watering your lawn or getting on the bus or meeting them at the mall, they say, you know, Harry, I have to ask you a question. What is it, Bill? Well, I've noticed that for the past couple of years, uh, there's such a change. Your family, yourself, the health, the well-being, the prosperity. What happened? And there is the opportunity to witness the Bible, the Christ, the Messiah. That is God's design. For you to accept mediocrity and your lot in life is absolutely from darkness and not from light. So in the Bible, there's a recurring theme. You can't miss it old to new, and that God is the God of the second chance and of the, the comeback story, the, the person who's lower than what they should be. Think of a man by the name of Gideon. Let's go through a list of few of these illustrations. Real life moments. The man is fearful, hiding in a trench, so to speak, trying to get some food. Let's make it plain and simple. An angel shows up and says, what? <laughs> like he's watching them, the Bible says, what are you doing here? What are you doing? And he tells him, you're a mighty man of God. He's scared stiff out of his mind. That's why he's hiding. But an angel comes and says, well, looky here. Are you serious, Gideon? Don't you know who you are? And Gideon goes all in. What do you mean who I am? I'm scared stiff. I'm a small guy. I'm nothing. I'm a nobody from a nobody family. And the angel can't, you know, can you just imagine this? And the angel goes, listen. You're gonna, I've got a job for you. You're gonna save a nation. And you know how you're gonna do it? Since you wanna know, in your own strength. You just don't know who you are. A comeback moment, a revelation. I'm not supposed to be stuck in the basement where I am. <laughs> that wasn't God's design for you any more than it would be for your children. Oh yeah, I want my boy to grow up and be a nobody, stuck in a basement, poverty stricken, sick with arthritis. Yeah, that's what I want for my kid. God forbid. So the angel shows up and realizes. Then there's a fella. We all know the story. Moses, he had an anger problem, a murder problem. And he's banished to the desert for 40 years. 40 years. He's so gone, so much time that when God shows up, not an angel, God, Moses says, no, listen, you must not know who I am. That was a long, long time ago. I'm not that man anymore. I can't do that. No, listen. And God is telling him, Moses, you think your time passed you by? No, your time hasn't passed you by. You think you've blown it because a long time has gone? You're the man of God. You're my man. Get up. I got a job for you. You're going to go save a nation. Don't get stuck where you're stuck. That's not God's design, that's your design. God forgive me for putting it that way. There's a time and a moment, a, a defining moment, where people come to their senses. Look at the prodigal. By the way, that means a guy who just blew his substance, wasted living, a reckless nut of a man. The Bible says he came to himself. Listen to his words very carefully. His father, make me a servant. He knew. Everybody reads that and goes, what a humble guy. He just wants to be in the barn. 
True, true revelation, I'll give it to you right now, by the grace of God. He didn't want to be in the barn. He finally got it, and his eyes opened up. He goes, wait a minute. The greatest is in the kingdom is in the servant. Tell me, Father, I want to obey you now rather than the way I live. And that's when the Father gives him the shoes. No servant gets shoes in the Bible. They are barefoot, only a son gets the robe. No servant gets a robe. Only the guy that's getting the double portion gets the robe. No servant gets the ring. The ring is the power to do business. It's the power to have commerce and be successful. He knew, I know how to get myself out of this mess. I'm not getting stuck with the pigs. I'm going back home to Father and saying the key words. I am going to be your servant. Unbelievable revelation. Unbelievably how we get it wrong. The guy got it to be great in the kingdom. Over and over again, you see a Hannah. Man, talk about being at the bottom of the barrel. Hannah, barren, completely barren. And yet God visits her when she finally aligns herself because she had a job to do, deliver a prophet for God. Over and over again, the Bible is replete with stories of people that were here that were never designed to be here but something happened. They got fed up with being here. Something finally clicked and said, I don't want to be that anymore. This feeling that I've denied inside of greatness, that I had dreams years ago. I want to resurrect that dream. I, that was from God. I'm designed to be here. I'm designed to be the head. I'm designed to save a nation for Jesus Christ. Oh, come on now, say amen. over and over again. How about this one? I mean, we all know these stories, but we need to hear them as a rhema to get us up from the basement. Listen to this, Peter. First, and you all know this, just let it, let it resonate. First, the guy sees the storm, he has his eyes on Christ, and he begins to drown. Where a way to end up, drowning. Then, Another story with him is he's told to stay awake for a little while. Pray with me, I'm in a mess. Goes to sleep three times, could care less. Another time, he thinks he's well doing. He's speaking so improperly that God calls him Satan. Boy, this guy's falling further and further down. Finally, when God needs him most, the most, he denies him. I don't even know the man. What a moment. To deny your Christ when he's needing you the most. What a moment to humiliate him while he's being tortured and cast further doubt and humiliation on him. And yet, forward and you see, day comes where he stands up for Christ and preaches a message that saves 3,000 people in front of the very people that want to kill him. No, he wasn't going to stay down at the bottom. No, failure was not going to define him. His past was not going to define him. You have men like Barak. What, are you kidding me? He's a coward and won't do anything unless a woman leads the way. Meanwhile, he got a second chance. Over and over again, Joseph, how about this one? This will make you cry. He didn't do anything wrong. He was the most virtuous man in the Bible. And yet, circumstances, brothers that hated and envied him, put him in a prison and in a cave, done, finished, in a hole in as a captive. Yet, the day comes where God says that, you don't understand, that was my design. See, many of us were in the basement because God had a plan. He saves the best wine for last. You don't know, it was God all along. Something is gonna happen that is so big, it's gonna shock you right out of your shoes. But ladies and gentlemen, there has to be somewhat of a sense of faith. The way with Jonah, he came to him a second time with a second word and a second chance. This day is God telling you, listen, I'm not finished with you. I haven't even begun with you. You don't know the thoughts that I have for you because Isaiah says, you are mine. You belong to me. What do you think I'm going to do with what I own, says the Lord? My goodness, it's time for people to wake up and shake that cloak off of bondage, of restriction. The church is needed in the world, but it's needed as a queen, as a reigning monarch. 
It's not needed as a threadbare mockery where people just mock it. I remember years ago, a man mocked the churches viciously because at that point we were having bilingual services and he came here mocking the service, saying you people don't even understand, have the wisdom to separate languages. And he had no idea why we were doing it. We were a struggling church trying to capture broken people. And at the time is what God told us to do. Mocked us viciously. It wasn't six months later that his child was very, very ill. And some of our ministers went to Long Island Jewish Hospital to pray. And there he was. And a lot of people knew him because he was vicious. I mean vicious. But what happened when they prayed for that child, the child got healed. And he came two weeks later to apologize. And we were no longer a threadbare church in his eyes. It was a church that displayed power to a mocking spirit. And the mocking spirit bowed his knee. And he got right there on his knees, crying, saying, I'm sorry. That's the church that God needs. Not broken and weak. No, a church that prays and God answers. A church that can move heaven and earth people that have faith and believe in their God, my God Almighty. But I'll tell you something, and I speak with respect, but I'm going to tell you the truth. A church that does not obey its God, it will never be a strong church. A church that would allow the weak and the hungry and the sick and the enemies to go and burn in hell and not do anything about it. It's a very weak church, but a church that will arise and make disciples, a church that will testify of the Messiah in Christ, now that is a church. That's a church that will move a nation, a city, a country, a world, a village. That's the church that will do that. You see, he wants to fill the hungry vessel. He wants those people that are fed up of being fed up. He wants those people that say, listen, I want a comeback story. I want to be much bigger than what I am. Look at this fellow by the name of David. It, it's, this is an astonishing teaching. Don't just hear it because you know it. This fellow is rejected by everyone, including his family. The prophet comes to anoint someone. And there is the, the prophet trying to pour oil over his children. And the vessel won't turn. If he gets the vessel to turn, nothing's coming out. God will not anoint that. And the guy asks, listen, do you have another kid? Is there anybody else? He goes, oh, come on, I do, but that's David. You got to be kidding me. He's, no, no way. Call him. He comes and the vessel turns. The horn easily pours the oil over his head. And this kid, rejected by everyone, dismissed by his family, perhaps mocked by his brothers, his father categorically saying, it can't be that little mouse. Well, that little mouse turned into a roaring king, and that's the whole object of God and the anointing. Anoint that one. So there's anointing that can break this bondage of mediocrity, this complacency, this accepting of the norm. That's not the norm at all. It's a lie from the pit of hell that you're not great. Greatness is in your DNA. There's a charge to glorify God in your life. Above all things, whatever you do shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I desire that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Basically, whatever you touch should turn to gold. My goodness! Why are we not fighting? Why are we not saying, wait a minute, the scripture says? Why are we not declaring success and strength and protection over our lives? Why, when we say Psalm 91, do we say it as if we're cowering in fear and we want protection, rather than boldly declaring that the angels will undertake for me? Why don't we stand and be what we are for crying out loud? It's amazing the lie that Christianity has purchased out of its own blood. We've paid the price for this lie. It's a staggering truth. David so understood this truth. He was the recipient and understood. I got called from that lonely mountain. I've been stuck looking at my dream, Mount Zion, and I could do nothing about it. My family, my own family, 
I hear the sounds of the festival. I see the wagons of food and joyful bounty and fruits going for the party. And me? They won't even call me. They won't mention my name. Day after day, year after year, David rejected. But then the moment came where God said, David, you are my man. You are my best wine. You are the psalmist of Israel. You, I will sit on your throne. Come, I need to anoint you. And he comes. And everything changes for David instantly. He's now the anointed man of God on planet Earth. Fast forward many years. David, understanding what took place in him, asks a question after he's the reigning monarch. And he says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I can bless? David knew, even though that's my mortal enemy, I have the power to discharge his past. I have the power to give him a second chance the way it was given me. David, in essence, evangelizes the mortal enemy to his own throne. And he does it because he knew everyone deserves a comeback story. Everyone deserves this doctrine in the Bible where they can be reformed, transformed, made anew, a new creature with new desires, new heights, new aspirations, beyond your limits. You are limited by nothing because you have the Christ inside of you. You know the story. Let's repeat it. The Messiah is among you. You know the story. An old monastery, ancient men used to be so prosperous. People would go there to buy their sugar candies and maple syrups and their raisins and their cookies and their wines. But as they got older and the place became a little disheveled, they became somewhat difficult to deal with and they became bitter among themselves. They were lonely, angry, and the spirit took upon them. And the place began to be just in terrible condition. All the visitors, the tourists stopped coming. The maple syrup stopped being made, the candies. It became quite desolate. And finally, as they're ancient and old in their 80s and 90s, they don't know what to do. Do we sell? Do we stop? Do we cease? It's just five or six of us. What do we do? And an old friend, a rabbi, who used to go to his little cabin down the road, they knew was up to visit in his yearly visit. And one of the senior mon the monastery guys, I forgot the name, goes to visit with him, commiserate. They're spending the day together, having a little coffee and cookies. And the guy tells his story, the monk. We're down and out. It's over for us. I guess we've gotten old and time has passed us by. And what should we do with the land? We don't know. It used to be so wonderful. And now look at its conditions. The roads full of weeds and everything gone. Nothing pretty anymore. The flowers stopped flowering. What do we do? What do you think? And after a couple of hours, the rabbi didn't have a solution. He said, listen, I'm sort of running into the same thing in the city. The kids no longer come to the synagogues. Life has changed. And as they're embracing and distancing themselves at the door, they hug one another. And the rabbi says, but I do have one thing to tell you. And the monk said, what is that? Well, I feel to tell you that the Messiah is among you. What? The Messiah. He's among you. The monk didn't know what to make of it, took his long road home, thought about the rabbi and his words, and kept mulling it over. What does that mean? Finally, when he came back and he met with all the other monks, did he have any advice? He's such a wise man from the city. No, he really didn't. He's having the same issues, in a sense. And they were about to disband, dejected, no answer. He said, but he did say the most curious thing. What is that? He said, the Messiah is amongst us. The what? The Messiah. He said, he's amongst us. And they all said, what does that mean? The Messiah. <laughs> what, oh, sure, I guess in Christianity, he's, but what does that mean? Because I don't know, but he sure was sincere when he said it. And they all went to their rooms, and slowly but surely, one of them says to himself, good Lord, it can't be John, right? He has a cantankerous, 
no, that disposition couldn't be the Messiah. Could it? But then again, he's so holy and he knows the Bible back at, holy smokes, could John be the Messiah? Another one says to himself, oh my goodness, could it be Bill? He's so soft and tender and kind-hearted, but he's so lazy, but he is so soft and kind-hearted. Could it, no, is that why he's so nice? And they started saying these things among themselves about each and every one, including the mean guy, the old guy, the cantankerous guy. My God, but his wisdom, and he's so faithful, and even though he gets angry, he's always there to help. Oh my God, he's the Messiah. And before you knew it, the strangest biblical occurrence took place. They started respecting and loving one another again because they thought, God forbid, I speak bad about you behind your back. You may be the Messiah, and the Messiah is amongst us. Began the people to come and saw a renewed spirit, and young men decided, let me go there for a weekend and learn the Bible. And those were young bodies and strong, and they said, you know, we can fix that road, and we can fix that building, and we can plant some flowers here, and before long you see tourists beginning to come again let's start up the maple syrup let's start up the candies and the cookies and the wine let's give it all a shot again the second chance came ladies and gentlemen because the messiah is among you all you need is a word that the messiah is among you and he comes to bring life and life abundantly he's not in this poverty stricken low-lying fog He's in the high clouds of heaven, in the many clouds of witnesses. He's in the beams and rainbows of light. He's in your joy and your happiness. He's in you. My God, the Messiah is in you. What would you do if you were the Messiah? Because you are.